Muslims paid more attention to religious sciences than to natural and social sciences. In the course of time, science declined. Although the Quran describes science and religion as two parallel paths towards the same goal, the religious path has dominated during the last 500 years. In the last few decades, several Muslim countries have acquired great wealth. Agricultural regions turned into megacities within a time span of one generation. But there's little scientific research conducted in these countries compared to other regions with the same affluence. The revival of the sciences has not yet taken place. There are various things that have held the Arab world back. Um, one of them, arguably, is the um, fact that they're so oil rich which means that money flows into the coffers of the ruling elite, whether they have a modern economy or not. Whereas uh, for the Japanese, for example, there are very few natural resources. They had to build a modern economy and an industry and so on, because uh, otherwise they wouldn't have survived in the modern world. Whereas in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and so on, the elite survives very well just by selling oil. So I think that's one thing that's kept them back. Another thing is that you need to, to build a modern economy you do need a kind of bourgeoisie um, and with a certain amount of economic freedom. There is clearly pressure from a rising middle class to push governments into more political and economic liberties. And if they succeed in having more open societies, more liberal regimes, they could indeed start catching up in the way that they are in India. Um, Turkey is already an example of this. Indonesia and Malaysia. Malaysia is already quite rich. Indonesia is not doing so badly. So, I mean, it can easily happen. Uh, it depends entirely on what happens politically. In the past few decades, modern technology has entered the Muslim world, but it became integrated only for its practical uses, without affecting much of Muslim tradition. However, the demand to reopen the discussion between science and religion has surfaced in the past few years, and not only among intellectuals. The internet is full of discussion groups dealing with what is called Islamic science, the reconciliation of science with the Quran. The discussion often refers back to its roots in the Golden Age, but the old position, that science and religion are two separated paths, has to be reviewed as technology today starts to fulfill what the Prophet had predicted, that we can know God through science. There are debates going on in Muslim societies, and these debates are good because I think in a matter of time, hopefully, some very clear positions will emerge about the relationship between Islam and science. After a thousand years of absence, new robots appear in the Arabic world. In the famous camel races of Qatar, the camels, previously mounted by children because of their light weight, are now run by even lighter robots. The Jewish community never made a real functioning robot during the Middle Ages, but they did produce a legend about a robot, the Gollum, and that story still seems to play an inspirational role in the scientific community of today. In that building over there, in the classical Ayala, I know at least four people who claim to, set, to be descendants of Rabbi Lu, who is known as the first Kabbalist to actually build a, build a Gola. Rabbi Lu lived in Prague in the 15th or 16th century, and there are a couple of different stories about his Golem. And one story is when the Golem died, he put the dead Golem in the attic of the Prague synagogue and he created a sentence to revive the golem at the end of all times and a couple of people in that building including Marvin Minsky have been told that sentence on the day of the Bar Mitzvah so they have been told by their fathers or grandfathers that they would be the ones who would revive the golem and of course then you can easily draw the parallel to AI right you have if you want to revive the golem okay you build an AI system 
two people who actually claim to be descendants. One is Jerry Sussman, a professor here, and the other one is Joel Moses, who is right now provost of MIT. We're sitting together, and they wrote the sentence they have learned to revive the goal on a piece of paper, and it was absolutely the same. So this tradition has actually survived for 400 years. And for me, it's just interesting that, that this element is so strong in the AI community. I just stopped to say hi. And there is one story where the Golan comes to life and has on its forehead the terms Yahweh Elohim Emet, which means God the Lord is truth. And he comes to life and removes the Aleph, the first letter of the word uh, term Emet, from his forehead, so that the re remaining sentence means uh, God the Lord is dead. And uh, the, his builders, of course, are totally horrified and say, what's, what's going on? I mean, how can you say God is dead? And he says, well, we are created in God's image, and we adore God because God was able to build something so fantastic as us. But if you are not able to rebuild yourself, the people will adore you for building that and not God anymore. But as soon as God is not adored anymore, he might as well be dead. <laughs> The Orthodox Hasidic community believes that the end of human life on earth is near. At that moment, the new Messiah will come just as all knowledge of God is known and the world will be filled with the Word of God. The acceleration in technology's advances seems to indicate that this moment is approaching. To speed up the event, Rabbi Yusuf Kazan took the initiative to put the Holy Scripts online. The prophecy of Isaiah is that the time will come when the world will be filled with the knowledge of God just as the ocean covers the sea. And it's a prophecy which was said by Isaiah many, many years ago. We today are able to actually see this happen. Today you have the Iridium satellites which are bringing the entire world connected into one small unit where telephone technology, wireless technology is being able to bring everybody together. This is something unheard of and undreamt of in the past. But these were prophecies which we heard of from our sages. And just as we heard those prophecies and we're seeing their fulfillment and their happening, so will the other prophecies happen where we know that the coming of Mashiach and the coming of the Messiah will happen. Technology is enabling us to actually see this happen. <laughs> The earlier periods of history, and we have, say, three pretty good-sized messiahs between 600 B.C. and 700 A.D. We have Buddha, we have Christ, we have Muhammad, um, produced over the whole planet, more or less, a system of the self. It's not clear that this unification of the self around what we would call probably today ego in Freudian language was fully formed before that period of time. And the interesting thing is, is that Buddha both invokes the ego and then contradicts it and says, don't go there. All right? It exists, and here I am making you conscious of it, but this is how you free yourself of it. Christ does the same thing, and Christ says that the way to freedom from ego is through love. And Buddha says that it's through non-attachment. So this produces what we would call modern materialistic culture. You know, it takes some time to work through culture and culture evolves and iterates through it and so we now have modern materialistic culture in which the ego is prized above all other developments. Well, that game is over. But the software...